Uh, book two, I don't know if everyone here knows, but I'm writing a trilogy. Uh, the first one is called Tune In. Does any, do people here have that book? Yep. Yeah. Hey, that's all um, Okay, so you know then that it's the first part of three, um, and the second two parts are in the works now, obviously. Uh, it's all I do. Um, my job is to write these books. I don't have another job. Uh, and I work very long hours at it, but as you'll know from volume one, books like that can't be written quickly. Um, they're full of research and the writing is very intricate and therefore it needs time. So I'm afraid it's going to still take time. Uh, I think when I was here a year ago and Dave asked me the same question, I said then that I was hoping that the book, book two would be out in 2020. Uh, and that is still an ambition, um, and I'm, I'm shooting for it. Whether I'll get there or not, we, we shall see in the coming years. Maybe by about 2017, I'll have a better sense of whether that's achievable or not. Um, and people go, oh, Mark, you know, I mean, you know, I might not be around my body. <laughs> There's an impression there of a Zimmer frame. That's volume three. Right, and volume three will be that big and heavy, yes. yes. Um, but they can't be done quickly, and the whole purpose is to write these books properly while there's still an opportunity to do it, um, to cut no corners, to leave no stone unturned. I have enough material now, easily, for a very substantial volume too. I could stop researching today and start writing tomorrow, and it would be out sooner. But I haven't yet turned over every stone. And the best things of all could yet, uh, may yet, you know, maybe yet be unfound. So I have to keep going and research until I'm content that I've found all there is to be found, uh, and then write it. So I'm researching and I'm still shooting for 2020, and I'm sorry if that disappoints anybody here, but really it will fly by. Um, maybe if you reread volume one slowly, uh, uh, and in particular the extended edition, maybe some of you here know that there is an edition that is twice the size of the mass market one, which I imagine is the one most of you have. Um, that would take, that's a, what, that's, a, that's a read and a half. So start reading that in about 2018 and it'll dovetail seamlessly with volume two. And okay, I've seen some of the research marks done in some of the documents, the original documents that have turned up, which has never been touched since they were written. There's no question, I, I knew this at the very outset, um, that the Beatles story had never been told properly before. Um, certainly not in bio biography form. Um, and I, people say, have you found anything new for volume two? Well, yes is the answer. I'm not going to give away anything about what it would be because I haven't even started writing it yet, but books on the Beatles, biographies particularly, they, they tend to be done, I've said this before so forgive me if you've heard it, but they tend to be done by, by jobbing journalists who decide they're going to write a biography of the Beatles and they'll, they'll take maybe two years over it, so they research the subject about that deep, you know, they surface research and then maybe a level or two down and then they stop because they haven't got any more time, they've got to write the thing and get it out. Um, whereas I'm just going down and down and down and down and down and deeper and deeper. And it is amazing how much material there is still to be found. I'm finding it lit literally on a daily basis. And it is rewriting the history. I, it's it, the book I now know will be completely different. I always knew that there was much more to be found, but boy, the Beatles story is really an untold story. Uh, and I intend to tell it in the same kind of contextual way as the first volume. Um, and it's going to be like, like you've never read anything before. Uh, and okay, I haven't started writing it yet, but the material is there, and, and I'm confident in it. So there you go. Yeah. So, we'll look up to the floor. Guy, that would just be going up straight away. Yeah. You know, having said that, Mark, I was wondering, um, have you found any significant revisions that would be required for the, the book that you've just done, or is there a point where you say, I'm not looking back? I mean, how, 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 would you, how do you ever stop yeah. you know, in the timeline? It's a good question. Uh, I always knew that volume one, which goes up to the 31st of December 62, that it would, by its very essence, it would turn up new material, which would be too late for me to use. Its publication would turn up things. Uh, and that has proven to be the case. Various people whose names I never knew have been in touch to offer me great things that are, would, I would love to have used, but 
it's you know one has to come before the other and the book has to, had to come first for me to get these things so I'm not upset about that I accept that it's part of history is an organic an organic being if you like and just because I wrote that book doesn't mean nothing more can ever be said about that period naturally more things are going to come up um, the paperback of Tune In is out in this country next week and they're selling it out there as advanced copies um, I had the choice of whether to add this new material to the paperback or to save it for some future use. <clears throat> and I've decided to make the paperback just a straight printing of the hardback. It's the hardback with soft covers. Uh, but I will in time use this new material in some kind of a revised work. But I'm not in a hurry to do that because I really want to get volumes two and three out first. Maybe in a long time to come, there will be an opportunity to, to revise all these things. Everything on this project is long. Um, it's still about something like 25 years of my own life invested in this. Uh, and I'm not really doing anything else. So it's, it's a long project, but in time, ultimately, I will release all the information. I don't want to hang on to any of it. It's not mine to hang on to, it's for, it's for sharing. Um, but I don't want to confuse the market with doing revised versions of the first one before I've even done the second one. So, but yes, a lot has come up. Yeah, thank you. Have you got chuck in there? Sure. Yeah, so Mark, uh, yeah. a couple of years ago here, yeah, you promised that uh, there'd be a surprise on every page. I've got the two-volume version, and your promise is certainly poured out. Uh, so many surprises. I've got my own favourites, so I wonder what were your favourites out of the surprises oh, you've got in volume one. There are so many. I to, actually, when you get interviewed, as I have a, a lot of them um, for broadcasts and also literary festivals, um, it's a, a lazy question that you get asked is, is um, what surprised you about your book and stuff? Oh, for goodness sake, you know, it took me 10 years. And for me, <laughs> there was a surprise constantly on every page. Um, and it's very hard to cherry pick. Um, there are quite a few things that I, I'm surprised no one's really picked up on. Um, one was my discovery that, um, as well as the Beatles contra, as well as Brian Epstein managing the Beatles as a group, Brian managed John and Paul as songwriters, and there were two contracts running there simultaneously. He was managing Lennon and McCartney, and he was managing the Beatles, and that was a, a revelatory discovery for me. And I thought it would make an impact, but no one's mentioned it. But in a book where there's a lot of, you know, surprises. You can't expect them all to be picked up. Uh, can I ask you for one or two of yours, and maybe in, around the room, and uh, I can elaborate if, if Well, maybe in June 62, the reason they got signed, um, the uh, my one we do was put out as a single. Yes. Uh, and I was achieved the success of doing those three things. Yes. Um, so, so many revelations that you can look at. An extraordinary story. How lucky we are to have the Beatles as recording artists. You know, how lucky they were to make a record and never knew either. And I don't, I, maybe someone's going to ask this, I don't yet know if Paul and Ringo have read this book, but if they do, they will learn something there, yeah. as, as well as much else. I thought it wasn't clear enough to read the book, is to why George Martin suddenly, why is interest in Beatles and the Beatles and Beatles and the 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 Please, please An come. extraordinary meeting, November the 16th, 1962, which none of them ever really talked about, and yet it's, it's quite clear what emerged from that meeting and the things they must have been discussing. Like, for example, on that in that meeting, they had one record out, which at that point I hadn't yet, had it got to 17? I don't think it had got to 17 yet, um, but it had been in the charts for a while, been in the charts for a month by then. George said, I want to make an LP with you boys, and came, we planned a trip to the cabin. Immediately in that meeting, he was going to make it, the Beatles' first album was going to be recorded live in the cabin. And he came to Liverpool in December 62 to check it out as a recording venue and decided that it wasn't really suitable. Um, but it came up in that meeting, now why did he do that, which is your question. Why, what flipped George Martin from being someone who had his arm twisted to sign them, to believing in them so thoroughly as, as that by November. And I think it's two things. I think it's one, he liked them very much as people. He was inspired by them as people. He, a key quote of George is that I, he said, I wanted them to like me. I wanted to be liked by them. 
he fell under their spell as quickly as, George, as Brian Epstein had done, and as audiences were whenever they saw them in the Cannon, and in lots of other places around England. Um, so there was a personal attraction there. And also I think there was the fact that Love Me Do, which was a song he had no belief in whatsoever, and had done nothing to promote, and in fact, if anything, he kind of put the brakes on it, had been a hit despite him. It had got into the top 20. It's a myth and a fallacy that Love Me Do only got to number 17. It drives me mad, you read it in all the books. It got, only got to number 17. That was a huge success. That number 17 chart position was a huge success, as was the fact that that record was on the charts for four months. It was still on the charts when Please Please Me came out, and then they had two records on the charts. The whole of the music business in Britain noticed that. And so for sure, George Martin noticed it. And he thought, if I can make a record with these guys that I do like, then the sky is the limit. And that's exactly what happened. But the speed of that turnaround is, is extraordinary, I do agree. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, fantastic book. Um, I was wondering if volumes two and three will look at all, all the people you get left behind, like Rory Saw, Ryan Williams, or uh, and so on, and what, what it was like to have one skin sort of link to yes. and you know, how it affected their life. Should I repeat that question or did everybody yeah, hear it? Um, will Volume 2 and probably also Volume 3 of the trilogy look at the people who got left behind, those who had an association with the Beatles but didn't make it, the likes of Alan Williams, Bob Wood, or Rory Storm, Pete Best even? Um, and the answer is definitely yes. Yeah, all the characters who come through Volume 1 will be threaded through Volumes 2 and 3 as well. I knew that from the start. I, I've written their histories in such a way that I'm not just going to stop when the Beatles leave Liverpool. Because anyone who had an association with the Beatles then had to deal with that. They became the biggest thing ever. And if you had an association with the Beatles, it affected you and your life and the way people reacted to you. And, it may have, there may have been an illusion of prosperity that, that might have come with it, but ultimately, unless you had the talent to back it up, it, was, it wasn't going to last. And yes, I will be looking at Rory Storm through books two and three, and Pete Best, very seriously Pete Best. I will follow his entire career until in 66 he gives it up, and then I shall look at what he did after that. Um, Alan Williams and Bob Wood are absolutely, because they wrote something, Bob in particular wrote something for a while, he had his own show on Radio Luxembourg on a Sunday night in 1964, he was quite well known, he went on television, but by 1967 he's a bingo caller, uh, and that is, that's a story that needs telling, because it's a human story, and I do want to make these books very much human histories and not the histories of stars. It's about people and their lives and how they lived and how they dealt with things. So yeah, Mona Best, Pete Best, Stuart, uh, not Stuart, but obviously, but um, the Sutcliffe family, I'll be looking at them, um, and Rory and everybody. Um, and ultimately, even those who did make it, who who found by the end of the 60s that they had gone, like Jerry and the Pacemakers and Billy J. Cronin, who couldn't buy a hit after about 1965. I uh, should be looking at all that. Yeah. Which is why it's going to be quite a big book. <laughs> <laughs> um, so following off that, I said people's lives are dealt with in the book. And yes. one of the sort of big revelations is how you piece together the, the, the set and the chain of events that led up to Julia. Uh, yes. Driving, yes. Um, twitching and going through and driving. So yes, another big, another big discovery. Um, mm. And also, you can sort of put a line in white. I was wondering, obviously, this is now out there. How has it affected Julia, the sister, Pete Best? Do they know you out there? Yeah, the question was um, a couple of the things in the book. One, I, I discovered, um, those of you who read the book will know it, so forgive me for repeating it, but an extraordinary chain of events whereby uh, John Lennon's mother, Julia, was run down and killed by a car on Menlove Avenue, <coughs> just kind of opposite John's house. In July 1958, <coughs> three weeks after her common law husband, John Dykins, who John Lennon called Twitchy, 
um, was done for drink driving on the same stretch of road, albeit on the other carriageway, uh, three weeks earlier, and the, the, the chain of events that began with that drink driving incident led to Julia being run down and killed. When I wrote the book, I was very sensitive to the fact that um, Julia, although she had, well, she had four children, uh, three of them are still alive, only John has left us, the other three are still with us, and I'm writing about their mother, and in the case of two of them, Julia and her sister Jackie, and many of you will know Julia because she's often here, I'm writing about her mother and her father, and the fact that her father's drink driving incident led indirectly perhaps, but all the same, that there's a chain of events that leads to her mother being killed, and I knew she didn't know. I was sure that she had no idea of it because I talked to her around it and it had never come up and she's written her own books and never mentioned it. Um, so I had to deal with it with great sensitivity because I didn't want to cause any offence. On the other hand, I, didn't, I, I had to tell it. So it was one of a number of stories in the book that I told with as much sensitivity as I could. Uh, and, and to keep my own opinions out of it just to relate the story as I researched it. Uh, and I, I, she won't talk to me anymore. Uh, and I heard that a year ago at this very event, she went on stage and was bad mouthing me. And okay, I, I would like the opportunity to address that, but I haven't, I don't, haven't had the opportunity. And I, I, I may not succeed anyway because she's upset. So, but she can be certain that I didn't in any way capitalize on it or glory in it or do anything other than tell it straight. But it must be a hard thing for her to accept. As for Pete Best, you say I've drawn a line under why he was sacked. I believe I had. Well, yeah, um, there's still, there's, um, I believe, uh, well, Spencer Lee really published his book called Drummed Out about why it was Pete Best sacked. And I said to Spencer, why are you bothering? Because we know now. When you wrote it, we didn't know, but now we do. But with his republication, and I think David Bedford's working on something about why it was Pete sacked. It seemingly won't go away, but as far as I'm concerned, it's been nailed. And it isn't me that's nailing it, it's all the other people who contributed. It's the other voices that, that nailed it, not my own, because, because I wasn't there. Um, I don't naturally have a daily dialogue with Pete Best anyway. I don't even know if he's read it. Um, his half-brother, Rogue Best, told me that I read your book and I, I agree with some of it and not all of it, but he didn't elaborate. Um, but whether he agrees with it or not, um, like I said, I'm not. I feel like I'm the, I'm just merely the intermediate here. I'm the historian. All these people who were present at things have told it, and I put it down in a way that is clear and makes sense. But it's not me that's saying people sat because. But it's very clear why he was now, and I don't think there needs to be a mystery about it anymore. In the direction, huh? Have I got a title for volumes two and three? Lots of people think I have, and, and, and write to me saying, when is, because they all think they know what the title is going to be. Actually, no, I don't have the title yet. At least not one that I'm completely wedded to, so it's, um, anything's up for grabs. But there are one or two ideas, for sure, floating around in my head. Thank you. Good question. Just to elaborate on that, Mark, we started out with uh, tune in. Yes. Is the second one going to be turn on? Right. The final one drop out. <laughs> well, some people say so. Right. <laughs> can I also just follow that up with uh, two supplementaries? Yes. Uh, uh, can you tell us where, uh, in chronological terms, the second uh, volume will end? Yeah. And also, uh, as we're all starting to hear, the recent death of Silver Black. Uh, did you have the opportunity to speak with Sir and all of that about the events which you're going to be writing? In yes. Do I need to repeat that for anybody who didn't hear it? Shall I? Yes, please. Okay. Um, part one of the question was, um, what was it? When is volume two going to end in, in its content? Yeah. That's right. Um, the answer I gave a year ago is still the same one, in that I want the content of the research to, to guide me on that one. Uh, and I, I'm a firm believer, and, and it's the same way the Beatles worked, is if you go in with a preconceived idea, you will be limiting yourself in some way. So I would much rather keep a completely open mind like they used to do, and let the research tell me. However, 
it's going to be in the 66-67 vicinity. It will be a, a dividing point at some point. And a number of them suggest themselves in that. It could be down off the Candlestick Park, it could be when they start recording Pepper, it could be the end of the year, it could even be Pepper's release or Brian's death. I'll find out when I get there. Um, but it will be in that ballpark. Um, and the second question, the second part of the question was about Scylla Black. And I, I didn't interview Scylla for this project. She, she didn't even reply to my letter, unfortunately. Uh, however, I have interviewed her before. Uh, and I had a, a two hour interview with her from about 13 years ago. Uh, actually, I was around in the 80s, despite what I said. <laughs> um, and uh, so, so that, will, that will do fine. Uh, and as you know from having read the first book, I'm not one of those writers who feels that I can only use what people have said to me personally. The book will be quite empty if I did that because so many of the players have gone. Um, I'm using anything that any, anybody has said um, in any medium to anyone at any time. And I will say, as you see in the back of the book, a full attribution for every quote. So you can always see where things come from in total transparency without not making anything up. You won't, and I'm not trying to sound like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but you, I, I always would read a biography, you read a quote, and you think, oh, I didn't know that, where's that come from? And the writer doesn't tell you, and then you think, hmm, did he or she make it up? And, and believe it or not, sometimes it happens. So I want complete transparency. So you'll see from that that though I, I got two or three hours, I got two hours with Scylla, um, all the other interviews she ever did, I'll use those two. And that applies to everybody. And I'll just say where it comes from. So I, I've got Scylla covered. Which I've heard about Scylla. This is a pretty wide question, but I'm going to say this for you. We have here this year, this group of the top of the end of the Yes. And uh, I, I did my own research to the law, and, you know, which I've, I've done for a couple of years ever since then. Right, yes, yes. Um, 292 was a figure that just got, well, Bob Wooler, who, who I have such respect for the man, uh, and who used to be here every year until his uh, demise. Um, he came up with the figure 292, and I, I was not one who wanted to argue with Bob, but I looked at it in a factual way and so came up with this different figure and I think he accepted it in fairly good grace but um, although maybe he knew about 18 engagements and I did as well as possible. Um, you, have to, you have to always keep an open mind to the possibility of being wrong uh, and you know I'm doing my, giving it my best shot but you know I could be wrong on things. I, I, I often think that if if you could really see events of 1961 and 2 happening in real life and, and look, have my book open at that page adjacent to it, it would be almost right, but somehow not quite, because you can't quite capture it. I've done my best, but I wasn't here and, and things, subtle differences. I can imagine a kind of Ray Bradbury science fiction film where the two things are just kind of slightly out of sync. Even though it's about the best representation you could get, it isn't ever quite right. And I'm conscious that I'm conscious of that all the time when I'm writing. Next question. Take it from this side. Well, jump over there. Right. When then the dead people that you brought the London Armstrong catalogue, the Armstrong catalogue, all the books there, you know, you lost control of it, but you still own a copy of the uh, minor shareholding of 24% each. Uh, the, the Northern Song of the copyright, Northern Song. Why at that point did Lennon and McCarthy sell their share of Northern Song? Surely it makes sense to keep all of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so you're talking about why did John Paul sell, surrender their share of their song copyrights when they had it within their grasp, they voluntarily sold it? The Northern Song situation it actually begins in Volume 1, as you may have seen, the company name hadn't been formed by the end of 62, but Dick James had come up with this extraordinary idea, and with extraordinary speed, to give John and Paul co-ownership of their songs and share in the profits of the company. Uh, and they were very excited about that possibility. And in Volume 2, I will pick, pick up that thread. 
and look at it all the way through. Because in 1963, um, when the company is formed, they have a 50% ownership of the company. Well, John and Paul have 20 each, and Brian has 10. And Dick James has the other 50. Um, in 1965, however, they floated the company on the stock exchange. They made it a public company. Anyone, anywhere in the world could buy shares. And incidentally, one of my recent research discoveries was the complete ledgers of who owned the shares, who bought a share in Lennon and McCartney, so and there's some very interesting names on there as to who factored a pump on Lennon and McCartney on the stock market. Um, but ultimately, in 1969, Lou Grade ended up with the Dick James side of the business, which was his and, and his partner's shares, 37.5%, and they were buying up other shares that were floating around the market that institutions held. So in volume three, I will look at what happened in that battle, because it was a protracted battle. Ultimately, I think there came a point when Jane, when Northern, sorry, when Grade, ATV, had control. They had the required 50 or 51% of the company, and there seemed no point in holding on to it anymore. They were made a very good offer for their shares, um, and the share of the company was going to be taken off the stock market. So they took the money, basically. They took the money um, and sold out completely their rights to Northern Songs, although they did continue to be paid royalties as songwriters. They, they, Paul McCartney to this day, though he doesn't own those songs, does receive revenue from their broadcast and their record sales and so on. He just doesn't have a stake in the ownership of it anymore. And the same applies to Yoko, of course. Is it fair to say at that point as well, <coughs> things like music contract words as they are today, where people know that they will earn money, yeah. before Paul later bought Southern Music and things like that, yes. because he knew it's rather than it by the music publisher. Yeah, um, it's, it's important when you're writing a contextual history such as this to not be judgmental about decisions taken at a time of greater naivety. Uh, we now live in a, in a world where the music, in the, well, the music industry is going through such tortures at the moment of its own making uh, because of the digital framework. But the music industry, as it would be developed, became a much cannier industry with artists understood what it was about holding on to rights. But in 1962-63, J. Dick James genuinely did offer them a genuinely good deal, and they, they, it was open and transparent, and they accepted it because it was a good deal. Ultimately, it was one that they came to regret, but that they didn't regret it at the time. And as we pass through life, each and every one of us makes our arrangements, and we have our, you know, I, I myself, I wrote the Beatles recording sessions book, which is my best ever selling book, and the one I'm most known about, or it was, without a royalty arrangement. And everyone thought I got beautifully rich over it, and I just had to watch EMI get beautifully rich over it instead. But I knew what I was taking on when I signed the deal, and I couldn't get angry about that or sue them because I signed the contract. I signed it with my eyes open, and so did they. But ultimately, of course, in later years, they came to be resentful. Um, and one of the reasons why Dick James sold his shares uh, to Lou Grade was because John and Paul had become really horrible to him. And I will look at that in full in volumes two and three about how, how they kind of abused him over a sustained period of time to the point where he just went, I don't owe you guys any loyalty anymore and sold his shares. And although it looked like he's the villain of the piece, there's always more to life than that. You must look at things at their fullest, broadest perspective, 100%, and that's my aim. So I'm not looking to cast villains or to praise people. I just want to research it as thoroughly as I can and tell it as honestly and straight as I can. Yeah. Don't leave that. Yes, well, well, you won't, I, I doubt now, the, the, the question was, um, this lady hasn't heard how George Martin responded to the revelation I give in the book. It's not a revelation, it's just a correct telling of the story for the first time um, of how he came to sign the book, because obviously it takes a little bit of the glow away from the fact that he saw how wonderful they were going to be and signed them. Um, George is now uh, 89, um, and he, 
I doubt, I may be wrong about this, in a way I hope I am, but I doubt that you will hear how he feels about it because he, we haven't heard of George for a while now. He's, you know, he's a frail old man now. He's lost his hearing, um, he, he's deaf, and I, 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 I have been friends with George for many years. Again, I wrote it with the utmost sensitivity, <clears throat> especially since it, it draws upon his relationship at that time, unmarried and now married relationship to Judy, and they've been married for 50 years. Um, again, I, so I told it sensitively, but how they responded, I don't know. I have a feeling that they're not overjoyed about it, which is what I would expect. I was actually due about a month after the publication of the book. I was asked uh, to give um, a, a toast speech uh, at a music publishing event that was honouring Sir George Martin, would I get up and introduce him and tell the potted version of his career and make a few jokes and bring him on stage? <clears throat> and I said to the organiser, eh, there's some things in my book that I'm not sure that George and Judy will totally welcome. And although I know I, I, I have an open heart and I will go on and do my best, and of course I've always been very fond of George and Judy, um, they may not want me to do it now. Have you asked them whether it's okay for me, to, for me to be the one? And he came back to me a couple of weeks later and said, actually, we will ask somebody else. So I, I, I may have surrendered a quality relationship that I always enjoyed with George and Judy. Um, but again, I can put my hand on my heart and say I told it without any agenda. Uh, and I didn't in any way kind of make light of it or make fun of it. <clears throat> it's actually, I prefer to flip it on its head and say that if George Martin signed the Beatles in any way because he was having an affair with Judy, which is actually part of what was going on, then great, because the Beatles were signed out of love. Because they have been in love for 57 years now. And I think in a way that's rather beautiful, but it is contrary to the way they always told the story, so uh, they may not like it. Um, one of the best bits in tuning for me is the stuff you got from the last one. Yes. Um, what a shame he went before, you know, for a lot of time. Did he agree to speak to you because he stepped down from Apple or did he just put him down? He's never spoke about the yeah. years. And it's, it's stuff so great, it's just it's more. And, so it's that one, but did you get in the file before the new books? The question is about Neil Aspinall. Um, many people are ah, Richie, and he was talking to Ringo, and I'm thinking, oh, you know, he still calls him Richie. This is a guy who's close. And um, I then went on to do lots of work with Neil on the anthology project and many other pro projects, or projects, as he used to call them. And I, he always knew I wanted to interview him. Uh, and while he was working at Apple, he was never going to do it. Um, I had warning about three days before he left Apple that he was leaving that Friday. It was a very sudden thing, but I'm well connected at Apple, and his PA phoned me and said, Neil was going on Friday. And after I picked myself up off the floor, was, Apple was Neil, and Neil was Apple. Um, I thought, well, maybe now I'll get to interview him. So um, Neil didn't do computers. So I still had a fax machine. I hand wrote a letter on the Friday of saying, I can't believe you're going, really sorry to hear you're going. I hope you're going under your own terms and not theirs. Um, but maybe now we can do it. And um, I faxed it through and it was put on his desk on the Friday and I guess it was among the papers he took away with him. <clears throat> and about two weeks later, my phone rang and it was Neil. And he said, okay, let's do it. So it was one of the great phone calls of my life, as you can imagine. Like when he and my phone and said, do you want to come into Abbey Road and listen to all the tapes? <laughs> then, uh... <laughs> um, and this was another one of those beautiful phone calls that I, I shall treasure. Um, but he was uncomfortable with how we were going to do it. And we weren't quite, we didn't quite set any rules that you couldn't. It was going to be however he felt comfortable. I went over to his house, we went out for lunch, he talked a lot about Apple and why he'd left and he was quite angry and bitter about things. 
And we went back to his house and I sat with him through the afternoon and I interviewed him for about three hours or so. And that came on top of a whole load of lunches that we had where after the lunch I'd gone away and wrote it all down really quickly before I'd forgotten it all because he always used to say great things. And I've used all of that. And some of that will trickle into volumes two and three, but I have to say that I didn't get the interview with him about all the years that I would have wanted. I would have really wanted to sit down with him 20, 30 times. And I think that's what he was expecting to do. But the next, I left it a little while, because <clears throat> I didn't want to push it. Um, the next time I phoned up, his daughter said, his daughter answered the phone and said, he's in New York. Um, and then the next time I phoned up, he's in New York and he's not very well. And then it was transparent that he had advanced lung cancer and wasn't coming home from New York, he was being treated there. Paid for by Paul, by the way, his treatment was paid for by Paul. Um, and Neil never came home again and I never spoke to him again. So that was that. And that is one of the saddest stories I have because we're all denied the gems he was going to tell us. Not me, but everybody, you know, because I would have just shared them all out. Um, and a big part of the history is now gone, and we'll never know. I should tell it as complete as I can, but it'll never be as complete as it could have been. Mm. Next question. Chat in front. Um, first of all, well done on all the speech that the interview today. It's been a long day for you. Yes. We sat in Patty Boyd's um, session before, and obviously it's a great opportunity to meet anyone that's got a first-hand connection being married to a beer. Did you seize any opportunity to get any information that you, you want to clarify up into that? Yeah, I, before coming here, oh, the question was um, Patty Boyd, gentleman was sat in on the Patty Boyd interview I did in the main ballroom. Did I get anything from that interview that I didn't know? I think, is that she the question? She seemed really nervous, I'd say. Like, she was, was she told me beforehand she, did, she was nervous and, and didn't really want to do it. Um, but I think she enjoyed it. She seemed to enjoy it. And, and I think she enjoyed the audience laughing at some of the things she said, which was very nice and natural. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I made sure in all the interviews I did today to ask a few things that I need to find out. Um, and also I intend to sit down with Patty at a great length and her sister, and I'm hoping to interview the two of them together so that they can each fill in the other's memory blanks. Um, because her sister Jenny was a big part of the scene as well. So, um, but I, I think it'll happen. It, these interviews are, are quite useful for me as well. Had you met before today? No, I've never met Patty before today. And she has been around on the circuit for a while now. Um, but I think this is her first trip here. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'm a great one for believing in the right approach at the right time. Obviously, if I heard she was ill, I might accelerate a little bit, but she's not, I'm glad to say. And I wouldn't leave it too long, but everybody in the right time, in the right way. Otherwise, you can frighten people off. So, but I think after today, I will you know, advance it. Yeah. I've warmed her up, in other words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The lady again. Um, yeah, I just can't help wondering if at the end of your long work, <laughs> Do I listen to the Beatles for pleasure still after a long working day? Um, yes. And it's always a complete pleasure. Uh, somehow or other, well, I know the answer to it. Why, why do I not tire of the Beatles? Why do I never get bored of the Beatles? Which is another of the questions I get asked quite often at, at literary events and so on. Uh, and it is impossible because they're just in endlessly interesting. And for me, they are the stuff of life. And, uh, I, and I still get as excited as a little boy when I find out a new discovery or hear something for the first time. And that is pretty much a daily occurrence. Um, my idea of ending a long working day will be to go and have a nice relaxing bath and put people's music on. And think about it differently because I need to be immersed in this subject. And I'm not listening to it only as music, I'm listening to it in, in my new knowledge of where they were that day or that week or what was going on between them, all the research discoveries I have, I bring it back to the songwriting and to the recording and they inform one another. And so I, I need to keep that constantly going and I work mostly in silence. So my evenings are, well, you know, some evenings are listening to the Beatles, yeah. Always with pleasure. I can also yeah. tell you first time that I, I, when I've found like, like probably 20 second little clip of an interview 
and I've emailed it to Mark. It's like, it's like this book of the thought giving him a golden nugget because we've never heard it before. Like, yeah. Wow. This is appealing. Yeah. My so t- I know he appreciates every tiny little. Exactly. My, I, I make an, uh, an, uh, an analogy in the introduction to Tune In, which is that it is all three volumes are like a giant jigsaw puzzle. Um, and I, I would contend that with the biographies of the Beatles that we've had before, and I'm not trying to cast aspersions on those writers, they were doing their job, but you have a pieces here and there, and enough to maybe form an impression, and you think you might read the book and you know what happened. But the Beatles' history is millions of pieces. All our lives are full of millions of pieces of moments and events and meetings and happenings and so on. And my job as the researcher is to find as many of these pieces as possible, and the 20-second nuggets are certainly part of it, and put them in where they belong. And the more pieces you have of that puzzle, the more pieces of paper that tell you where Paul was that day, John came in for a meeting, George went home early, these are things which in themselves are quite almost meaningless. You put them into the puzzle and you see how they fit alongside everything else and then you step back and you've got the picture. You have the, you have the detail and you have the bigger picture, literally. And that is what I'm doing. So every 20 second nugget is of great value to me. Every piece of paper I can find. And the book has an appeal and that appeal is ongoing. If anyone in this room has or knows anyone who has something that they think I may not have seen, some unique item in their collection, a piece of paper, a photograph, whatever it might be, I am interested to know. It might, it might well be something I know about, probably will be, but I'm prepared to, 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 to check it out in case it's something I haven't seen and it can just add to the history which I'm going to be putting down on paper. Question right the Follows on from my answer. Um, what the moment felt like a social history rather than a biography? Yes, um, thank you. Could the could this one from any other city as well? The book feels like a social history rather than a biography. Could the Beatles have come from anywhere else other than Liverpool? Um, I wanted to write a social history with the Beatles at the centre of it. Um, one of the problems I have with other books on the Beatles is that they just tell the Beatles story. And the Beatles were always part of a scene. They're being influenced by what's around them, they're, they're both taking from it and feeding it. Um, and they have friends and, rel- and, and rivals and so on, and, and all that is, is relevant. Um, so yes, I'm telling the social history and that will continue. Because the Beatles, we all, it's such an easy phrase, the Beatles changed the world. I believe that they did, but if I'm going to say that, I have to show it. I have to prove it. How did the Beatles change the world? So I've got to show the world what it was like and then show what it was like after they came in and changed it and how everything was different from that point onwards. Actually show it by research, which is why it's taking so long. Uh, and my research is not just pure Beatles, I'm looking at a much wider story as a result. And I'm telling the whole story of the Stones in this book, the next book, and the whole story of so many other artists as well. Because when the Beatles go to nightclubs and they're talking with Mick and Keith, what kind of contract are you on? Well, what, who, what promoter have you played for? Did you play for that toss at the BBC and all that? Those kind of things, I, I want to have, I want to be in those conversations. So I've got to show the world as they talked about it. Could the Beatles have come from anywhere else other than Liverpool? I think is actually a separate question, um, but my, I'm, I'm certain the answer is no. I think it had to be Liverpool because, like I just said, they were part of a scene and they, they thrived within it and they were kings of it. And what was this scene? Well, Liverpool was the only place where there was one. It was the only place where they could have those experiences of playing seven nights a week. Um, Part of my research was to look in newspapers of Bristol and Newcastle and Glasgow and London for sure, Manchester, Birmingham, what was going on in those cities when Liverpool had this thriving scene? And the answer is almost nothing. Very, very little. Maybe some clubs on Fridays and Saturdays, but nothing on Mondays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays and Fridays or Thursday. So you've all the groups in those cities, such as there were, there weren't many, had to be amateur, they had to have day jobs because there wasn't enough money in it to play, to earn from music. Liverpool, you could earn a living here playing music. So that meant the Beatles could be and were professional, playing 350 gigs a year. 
gave them enormous experience and know-how, which nobody else in Britain had, and which meant that when they broke through, they, they appeared to be like ready-made, and indeed they were. Whereas until that time, stars had been kind of manufactured. Even someone as great as Cliff, and I'm a big you know, admirer of Cliff and the length of his career, um, he was kind of made into a star. He was a star before he'd even really played a, a proper show. Whereas when the Beatles became stars, they had enormous experience under their belt. And they, they knew what they were doing. And they weren't, no one was going to tell them what to do. Well, that's a Liverpool attitude right there. So uh, Liverpool has to be the place, I think. Mm. Good, I'm sure any more questions? Did you have any before that? Sorry, I'm not going to um, Well, I, I was going to ask, when you were talking about do you listen to the Beatles music, I was, gonna, I was kind of wondering, let's say you're writing about the Stark Club era or Love Me Do or a particular time frame, do you sort of immerse yourself in that sort of music or would you listen to the light up? I mean, you just listen. Yeah. Just what's your writing <clears throat> correlate to what you listen to after you, you bought? Yeah, um, I, I always try to immerse myself in what was going on. So um, with the copyright expiry rule of 50 years, it was quite handy that um, in 2011, there was, a 90, there was a CD release, an eight CD box set of every record that had been on the charts in Britain in 1961, on eight CDs in order. I, of course, I listened to that, and the same for 1962 that came out in 2012, just to hear the environment as the Beatles joined as recording artists and, and what it must have been like for the public who are listening to this all the time to then suddenly get Love Me Do, which Love Me Do, i come back to it a second time, may appear in the context of all the Beatles recordings that follow to be a relatively primitive, simple, straightforward recording. In its time, which is the only way you can really measure it, it was like nothing and no one had ever, anyone had ever made before. The Beatles then and through 63 were making sounds in the recording studio that no one had ever made before. Not just records, but sounds. Um, so, and I know that because I listened to the context. So yeah, I do listen to a lot of what else was going on. Um, one of the recent things I did, and Dave, Dave who's sitting here, is a help to me in many, many ways in my research. Um, I was keen to know the Beatles' first television appearance, national TV, January 1963, Thank You Lucky Stars. In volume one, I talk about how that TV appearance came about, which was quite a momentous little moment in itself. They know at year's end they're about to be going on that TV show. Um, they were bottom of the bill. They were the last um, song before the commercial break. But I know of the other artists in that show who were in the studios with them, so who they met, the people they met that day, and what songs they were doing. And I asked Dave to help put me together a playlist of the other music in that show so that I could be like someone sitting at home watching TV and you get David Macbeth doing Good Year for the Girls and you get Chris Barber. There were two jazz numbers in that program. And then suddenly, you have to imagine it, the Beatles come on, four guys, three guitars, long hair, straight, looking straight into the camera, three of them both harmonizing on stage. Please Please Me, which is a fantastically dynamic song. So in its moment, what that must have been like and why there was a great spike in sales the Monday morning after that Saturday, because shots were shot on the Sunday, Please Please Me sales go up. So listen to it in context if you really want to hear what an extraordinary thing the Beatles, that, that song was and what the Beatles were in their time. And so, yeah, I'm doing that all the time. Yeah. Go on, off the front. Um, a little off topic, but um, in John and Yoko's album, Pink Virgins, yeah. there's two records that can be heard playing in the background. Yes. One's together, I'm unsure of the artist, and the other one is sometimes called Push It By, Push It By. Yes. But my research hasn't um, discovered any song by that no, uh, yeah. name. Can you tell us what they are? Do you know? Okay, the question was, if you listen to John and Yoga's Two Virgins album, which actually came up in my conversation with Peter Asher just now, when he was saying, I don't think anyone really listened to those records. Well, I have. <laughs> and I think a few people have. Um, you can actually hear a couple of music, old music tracks playing in the background just as part of the, the sound collage. What are they? 
Uh, one of them appears to be called Together and the other one Hushabai Hushabai. I'm working on it. Uh, it's research that is uh, unfinished at the present time. Um, I did check into, did he have the radio on in the background, and I looked at the BBC programme logs to see what songs were going out that night that he was recording. That didn't prove anything. So, But I'm working on it, and I'm, I'll, I'll get there before I need to write about it. I've listened to about 30 versions of Together, and none of them seem to be that to, one. They're not together enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> But I'm glad you're doing that research. Time. Will you share that research if you find it? Will you, will you make it public in some way? Yeah. Good. I will do. Good. Please do. There's a, a chap in the room, I think I may have seen him earlier, uh, who does a brilliant blog about John Lennon's house. It's Ken Wood. Um, I forget the name of the, uh, the, the web address. Is, are you here, Sean? He was here. I did see him a minute ago. Get in touch with him. If, I mean, he'd, he'd be very happy to put it up on his blog and, and credit you as the finder. And I'll be happy if you find it. But one year, I wonder what do you write? Bottom of In your book, it's a big page of the conversations. Yeah. Can you mention that in any way a studio part of the recording of it is a cover song and change the microphone? Is that my way? Which track? Did you say? Part of the name you call the cover song and call the name you call the Yeah. Um, after they recorded Rubber Soul and before Revolver, in other words, yeah. they, did they change the microphones, the Beatles? Did they ask for a change? No, did AMI change the microphone? Oh, gosh. It's a valid question, um, because there are readers of the book who want technical information, um, and I can't ignore that. I'm not that technical myself. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, have you have you seen the book Recording the Beatles by Brian Keyhue and uh, Kevin Ryan? That very probably has the answer. I think if any book will do it, it will be that one. Yeah, um, I know will be. I know Brian and Kevin, and um, I know that they do their research properly. So I I don't feel the need to research the microphones because they've done it. So but I'll, I'll look at what they've done and I'll say it comes from their book. Um, because it is, it is relevant. I'm sure I read that somewhere. Yeah. You may have even read it in my book, but um, I'm renowned as the memory man, but all sorts of people tell me about things I wrote in books a long time ago. And I actually, like recording artists, don't always listen to their albums. I actually very rarely read my books um, mm. because I'm moving forward. So um, I, people rave about the recording sessions, but I haven't looked at it in about 25 years. <laughs> Yeah. No, we've got three questions in the line. We'll go one first. Yeah. There you go. Mark, if you see the white in Melbourne, and I didn't do the 964, because one of the small board, um, you know, they, they took it straight, and we showed the song where it was the first before, and Jimmy Nickel was the standing guard. But on the last night in Melbourne, Rio had, you know, this song and whatever. But the local TV stations, and what I thought it was, it's a big packer. They actually had a live, um, you know, giant of, of the last show that night, and the quality is exceptionally good. And have uh, you seen it? The footage. Is, is this the show? Yeah, and um, the Beatles sing for show. Which yes, one is that? Is that the same one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's basically they, you know, they've got like half a million people at Adelaide and stuff like that. Yeah. But because of that live show, like, I was at that time, I remember I was two, but they came to Melbourne, and I thought, that's really Yeah. And, and so did half the other, in half the country, and, you know, down in Australia. Yeah. That's what sort of gets. And the quality of the show is exceptionally good. Even all these years later, you can watch it, and it's very, very important during the period where sometimes they didn't even have, you know, the next part in it. Yeah. Or in it. Yeah. Yeah, there is. I, I, actually, is it not on YouTube? I, believe it's, I haven't looked for it on YouTube because I have it on a DVD. Right, but I would, I would imagine it is up there because a lot of stuff is up there. Is it up there? It's it's there. Yeah. Didn't yeah. Australia have they had a policy of recording the shows when they went over? They, like they got a Buddy Holly show from '58. That's what they used to do there. Yeah. And that's what kind of, you know, all of a sudden we all sat home back then. Yeah. And and that was the last one yeah. that was actually done right. And it was a really great marketing. Yeah, so, mm. I, I think by 64, the, the Australians have been, in, been doing it for so long, since the 50s, yeah. that they've got it down to the final. Better than the Americans, because they've complained about the excellent shows. Yeah. Awful sounds. Yeah. 
So you could be right. Yeah, um, hasn't come up at all today until now. I'm going to mention it, but I, maybe people here have forgotten. But Apple have announced there's going to be a new project. Uh, which will be available next year, released next year, a big emotion picture for the move for the cinemas about the Beatles live. Um, and Apple have been drawing upon the world's archives uh, for the last few years to find all the best footage of the Beatles on stage. And they're going to be telling the story in documentary form of the Beatles as a live act, I think from 63 to 66. And, and I'm pretty certain that they're gonna be drawing on that on that of the film because it is so good. Um, but they, they've not only found all that kind of stuff that we know about, I think they found a lot of material that we don't know about. People's home movie footage and so on. Some of which is on YouTube, but they've got more. And it's gonna be in beautiful quality and that will be out next year, probably with a soundtrack album. So next year there's gonna be this new Beatles product, which I'm sure is gonna be very high quality. Is that still yeah. directed by Ron Howard? Yeah, is that still it's been directed by Ron Howard, yeah, yeah. I have seen a trailer uh, for it, which hasn't been issued yet, and it looks extraordinarily good. Mm. Yeah. Will they chop the songs up like they usually uh, I don't know, um, because I haven't seen it, and there may also be certain liberties with it that the die-hard fans would, would be upset about, um, but um, they are conscious of the fact that they need to make this project for broader appeal, and they want to shoot for, for example, the best sound quality, and if they've got a great piece of film and the sound quality is poor, I have a feeling they're doing something to it. <laughs> Which perhaps they could, yeah. Uh, we don't have that much influence, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. There you go. Go to. Uh, really enjoyed your interviews today, and my wife and I were wondering while you were listening to the different people, was there a time that you thought to yourself? I know what they're telling me isn't true. <laughs> and, and, really, and really, you know, because it's the long period of time between events and now. Yes. And, and as you do your research, do you find that, you know, what percent of what people tell you wind up to have some balance in it or some yes. mythology? Well, the key job of a historian must be to seek the truth and to know when to disregard what people are telling you. It's uh, first-hand experience, anecdotal experience, the quotes of those who have witnessed at events that I wasn't present at, must, are important, no question about it. But you mustn't swallow everything that you're told, because with the best will in the world, there are people, well, people just naturally embellish or miss details out or whatever it might be with the constant retelling of stories it's just a human trait that the stories will end up ga gathering layers of things that maybe aren't quite right the Beatles story is full is so huge and magnificent that there is a tendency on the part of some but not all of people to push themselves into the centre of the story a little bit more than they actually were there um, my job is to not swallow everything because then the book will be a mass of contradictions. This is why I really use documents to form the bedrock of the, of the book. Um, because if I know when things happen, then uh, the anecdotes go on top and if they fit properly, they probably deserve to be there. And if they don't fit properly, it's because something's wrong and I won't use it. And I often leave out really interesting, witty, amusing anecdotes that readers might enjoy, but I don't trust. And there are people who have a tendency to do that quite heavily. So you have to be really aware. Um, did, does this answer your question? Yeah, I was just curious when you... When... Oh, um, w was I listening in, to, in the main room and people... Once or twice, I thought, yes, that isn't... I don't think that's quite how it happened, but when I was a young... When I was young... And I've been researching and I've been a Beatles big head for a long time now. Um, when I was young, I was and green, I used to try and say, no, 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 it wasn't quite like that. And that irritates people. And <laughs> I, I learned the hard way, once or twice even with Paul. Um, <laughs> don't do it. Just let them think what they think. Um, but inwardly, so now I've grown up, I, 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 I'm listening to someone speaking to me and I think, I won't use that bit. 
But uh, there's no point in picking an argument with people because it's disrespectful. We all have your own model, so we want to <laughs> yeah. How would you feel about it? Um, maybe a couple more questions. There's a lady there with a hand up before, so we'll go. Did you know that Cynthia Lennon Bill and Paul Jai and Isaac Fyfe were in that book and Tim Tierney got from her? No. I didn't know that she was serious, dear, I knew that she was ill. Um, I wasn't. I, I, I don't claim friendships with, with many of these people. Ultimately, you do end up, in some instances, forming a friendship. But um, mostly I try to be professional about it and, and just be respectful and dignified and lead people to their lives after, you know, after they've helped me. Uh, and try and respect them in the way I write the book as well. Um, I knew Cynthia, but I didn't know her that well. I knew she was ill, I didn't know she was that ill. And did I get as much from her as I would have liked? No. Um, I've got a lot of other material from her, um, but she is another example of, unfortunately, I don't quite have enough. I, you won't notice the hole in the book, there won't be a gap there. But for sure there were questions I, I would have asked her had I had the opportunity. But. This is the reality now. We're talking about events of 50, 60 years ago. And, um, you know, uh, the guy who worked for NEMS, who died, you know, we'll probably hear no one knows his name, Keith Howell. Um, wonderful interviewee for me. He told me some great things, all totally trustworthy and believable. Uh, you won't have known of him, so you won't also know that he died just a few weeks ago. And this is happening a lot now. Um, and I won't get to everybody, but I'm doing my best, you know. I mean, I worked on the Beatles Anthology project, and I was part of a big team of people who, who put that project together. Um, I need a team of people for this project, but um, budget dictates that I'm on my own. Um, so I'm trying to be all things to all people and work as long as I can, but I can't do everything. And sadly, people are going before I can get to them, and it's, it's a real pity, but I'm doing my best. Okay, we'll have to get to the last question then. Somebody's moving over to the front here to ask this one. Mm. You'll, you'll correct me in this if I'm wrong. They came back off an American tour at the end of August 1965. They started recording Rubber Soul June, October 12th. October 12th, yeah. In between the two, five, six weeks of nothing. Mm. They ended up in the last recording session for Rubber Soul, needing three songs. Yes. Why didn't they start the recording process that bit soon? Why the gap? Yeah. Very good five, question. Five, five or six weeks of nothing left, <coughs> yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, was unheard of. Before. Yes, yes, they took a break. Um, What's the question? The question? Yes, the question was, um, the Beatles returned <coughs> from the, the, the second tour of America, the, the 1965 one, ended on August the 31st, they flew home the next day, September the 1st. They didn't begin recording their next album until October the 12th, and that became a very concentrated period of sessions until I think November the 11th and they ended in a real rush because the record had to be out by Christmas and they knew it, they wanted it out by Christmas, it wasn't here my forcing them, they wanted it out for Christmas. So why did they leave it so long and end up in a crush of time when they could have started it earlier than October the 12th? And it's a very good question and I don't yet fully know the answer but it's one of the things I'm looking at. Clearly they needed a bit of a break. One of the key aspects of volumes two and three, and I think probably two more than three, is that the periods when the Beatles appear not to be doing anything are as interesting as the periods when they were. Because, for example, they begin recording Revolver 6th of April, 66. They haven't done anything through January, February, or March. A lot of books just kind of gloss over that period of time. George gets married, but what else happens? But it's, it's what they're doing in those three and a bit months that actually informs Revolver. They write the songs then because of the experiences they're having. So I, I need to look at all these so-called downtimes as actively as I'm looking at their project times. Um, I think they must have told Brian they needed a break, um, but I don't know why it was six weeks. Um, but I'll be looking at what they were doing in those six weeks as much as possible. I, I think some holidays were taken and they were just relaxing a little bit. But obviously they left themselves with a problem. However, as usual with the Beatles, there was a pro problem that they solved in the most imaginative and wonderful way. Further research is the answer. Further research is actively being done at the moment, yes. 
Yes, you will find out. Yes. Thank you. So there we go. Ladies and gentlemen.